Thank you everyone for uh, joining us. This is the uh, the second in the current series of uh, seminars uh, that we're putting on at Landmark. Uh, today, uh, Katie and I are going to look at some issues that arise in mixed use uh, developments. Um, you can see our pictures on the screen and you can probably see us when we're, we're talking. Um, Delighted that you can join us today. Hope you find the session informative and useful. Just a few housekeeping points before we start. Uh, your microphone's automatically muted, so you won't need to adjust anything at your end. Uh, videos are turned off as well. We're going to record the uh, webinar and the recording and the slides are going to be put on the website uh, afterwards. So um, you'll be able to get hold of them. Uh, over the next few days. We're likely to have time to take any questions during the webinar. If you have any real sort of pressing general queries, uh, you can try asking them in the chat section, but we make no promises whatsoever that we will get to them, I'm afraid, because we're doing a bit of a whistle-stop tour um, through, through the topic, and we're aiming to stick to around 30 minutes or so. Uh, the last thing is, if your connection gets lost at any point during the webinar, just um, rejoin the meeting by clicking on the original link and it should, should bring you back in. So if we look at um, what we're going to cover today in terms of the, the scope of this presentation, um, so it's mixed use, so we're, we're thinking about mixed residential and commercial developments. We're not going to cover everything in the slides today. We've left it in the slides because you'll be able to download them and, and take a look at everything in due course. So if we skip over bits, that's the reason. We want to keep it keep it short and, and sort of stick to our time. Um, we're just going to pick out some of the bits that we want to sort of pull out. It's intentionally aimed at those of you who predominantly do commercial work, uh, litigators and transactional lawyers. Uh, who want to run down some of the issues and some of the pitfalls that can arise when you start dealing with residential uh, work. Those of you who do lots of residential work already may not find this talk useful. There's the, uh, there's the health warning. So um, what I wanted to start with is just a quick overview of the key statutory provisions that you uh, should be aware of. Um, first up, 1985 Act covers lots of ground. Um, provision of information, regulation on service charges, which, are, which I'll touch on uh, a bit later, which includes things like sort of consultation on major work, so on and so forth, um, and, and provision for recognised tenants associations and things like this. Uh, can of Coke, uh, the year that new recipe Coke came out was 1985, I think, from memory. Um, then if we move on to the 87 Act, uh, I've always wondered whether this is just all the bits they forgot to include in the act two years earlier. Um, rights of first refusal, which we are going to uh, look at today. Uh, then we have appointments of a manager in a residential context, um, compulsory acquisition, variation of leases. Uh, again, of course, this is all purely by reference to residential properties. Uh, the statutory trust upon which residential service charges are held uh, and information for tenants. Um, on to the next slide, uh, that's the 2002 Act, the year that the first camera phone was launched randomly. Um, the 2002 Act contains lots of further um, hurdles that you have to jump over when you're dealing with uh, resi property. The vast majority of these provisions that we're looking at uh, only relate to long leases. So leases granted for a term of at least 21 years. Uh, the main thing to note from the 2002 Act is uh, lots of hurdles you have to jump over uh, in order to forfeit a residential lease. It can be done, you've just got to jump through some hoops. So you have to get the determination of the breach if it's a non-rent uh, breach. Uh, the if it's service charges they need to be in that same for three years they might have to amount to more than 350 pounds uh, there's prescribed forms of demand for ground rent so on and so forth and there's all the stuff about the right to manage and other limitations so lots in there to be aware of and then other bits and pieces to have on your radar uh, section 8 of the housing act is the need to have a determination of uh, the payability of service charges and administration charges before you can forfeit uh, 
uh, the 67 Act, uh, obviously enfranchisement and things we're going to touch on briefly, uh, and that's in the 93 Act. Um, just the last slide that I was going to mention uh, in a residential context, being aware of things like consumer rights, which uh, can touch on residential long leases, where someone has purchased their interest in the property as a consumer. Uh, and things like the Protection from Eviction Act, and, and this is particularly relevant in mixed use tenure. Um, I've made reference there to the Pira Baccarin case. That was a case where uh, the landlord had let on one lease a shop with a flat above, a, a very common situation, of course. Now there were separate entrances to the shop and to the flat, and the landlord peaceably re-entered the commercial part because of the unpaid rent consciously didn't re-enter the residential part because of the Protection from Eviction Act, uh, but nonetheless was found to be in breach of the Protection from Eviction Act because part of the property was let as a, uh, that had been let was occupied as a dwelling. So if you have only part, it's caught by the residential uh, overlay, and that's going to apply in all sorts of other contexts as well. Um, so, so once you've got an element of residential, just be aware that in many of these provisions, that's it and the whole of the whole of the letting is brought within the residential overlay. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to Katie uh, to look at collective enfranchisement. So uh, collective enfranchisement, um, so we're dealing with part one of the Leasehold Reform Housing and Urban Development Act 1993. Um, just be careful that there is enfranchisement of houses, which obviously doesn't generally arise in a mixed-use scenario. Uh, they are quite separate rules, they're in a different statute, they're in the Leasehold Reform Act 1967. Um, so in terms of collective enfranchisement you're looking in, in really basic terms at a scenario where a sufficient number of qualifying tenants come together to acquire the freehold of a building. Um, and in terms of issues that may arise with mixed-use developments, um, there are two in particular. Firstly, do the premises qualify? Uh, and then if they do, specifically what property may actually be acquired? So in terms of whether the premises qualify, uh, you've got three conditions and there is section 3.1. Uh, so first of all, they must consist of a self-contained building or part of a building. Uh, they must contain two or more flats held by qualifying tenants and the total number of flats held by such tenants is not less than two thirds of the total number of flats in the premises. But, um, and this is the important bit for mixed use premises, chapter one, so collective enfranchisement, does not apply to premises if they fall within the proviso in section four. And section four says, where well, any part or parts of the premises is or are neither occupied or intended to be occupied for residential purposes, nor comprised of any common parts of the premises. And the internal area of that part or parts is 25% of the internal floor area of the premises. So it's a bit clunky, but essentially what they're saying is, if you have a sufficient amount, i.e. more than 20% of non-resi, then it won't qualify. So, Unsurprisingly, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, basically, there are three types of areas for this proviso. You've got common parts, number one. You've got occupied or intended to be occupied for residential purposes, two. And then you've got neither occupied nor intended to be occupied for residential purposes. And what you're looking for is whether C is more than 25% of the total internal floor area of the premises disregarding common parts and that's quite important because quite often people will say well if it's a commercial common part you lump it in with C that isn't right and it will skew your percentages so a couple of things to be aware of with common parts um, first of all residential purposes what does it mean it doesn't mean only home or dwelling uh, it means usual activities of things like living, sleeping, eating, washing. Uh, one of the most important cases on this is a case called Westbrook Dolphin Square and Friends Life 2015 decision. Um, be careful, it is extremely long. Um, best thing to do with it is to start with, I think it's paragraph 200. 
which starts to talk about what common parts are. And the key thing to note is it's not a question of title, it's a functional test. So it's, it's not necessary that the area is devoted to common purposes as a matter of obligation in the lease. And it also doesn't matter that the tenants don't have access to it. So for example, a boiler room serving more than one flat within the premises, it's highly unlikely that individual tenants would have access to that boiler room. It is nevertheless a common part. Um, a, another example, and it's an example that's in the Westbrook case, is a gym. It may be that there's a gym within a building that the tenants are entitled to use under their leases. That's a common part. It may be a gym that the tenants have been using and are entitled to use, albeit it's got nothing to do with the lease. That's a common part. If it's a commercial gym by somebody, for example, Fitness First or somebody like that, and you have to pay to go in, that's probably not a common part. Um, and the other important point to note that's often overlooked is that an area that isn't demised, but is used by two or more commercial occupants is a common part. So a commercial common part is a common part, even though no residential tenants either have access to or benefit from that area. Uh, that's a county court decision, Marine Court and Rother District Investments, but it is approved in Dolphin Square. So something just to bear in mind. Moving on, what can you acquire? So if your mixed use premises is the subject of a collective enfranchisement claim, or I suppose if you're acting for the nominee purchaser. So first of all, it's the freehold of the premises in which the qualifying flats are contained. So essentially the building. It's a pertinent property, which is demised by the lease of a qualifying tenant, and it has to be demised or it's property which a qualifying tenant is entitled under the terms of his lease to use in common with occupiers or other premises of other premises. So, for example, if you have a forecourt, um, that's likely to fall within the third category. There. So the freehold of those areas is liable to acquisition. There's also leasehold interests that may be liable to acquisition. So you have to acquire the head lease to a lease held by a qualifying tenant of a flat. So essentially an intermediate lease has to be acquired if it's of a qualifying flat, there's no option there. What's important is the second one. So it's possible you may acquire a leasehold interest which demises common parts if the acquisition is reasonably necessary for the proper management or maintenance of those common or additional parts. Uh, and there's quite a recent Court of Appeal decision on this. Uh, it's LM Homes and Queen Free Court. And that case is important really for two reasons. First of all, it confirms that when you're talking about the premises, so that's the part you're entitled to have the freehold of, that includes airspace and subsoil as it would at common law on a conveyance of the freehold. So you're entitled to the freehold of those areas. That's all within uh, premises. What had happened in that case was development leases had been granted of the basement, the subsoil and the airspace. And the Court of Appeal agreed with the upper tribunal and said actually um, they all demise common parts uh, and the acquisition is reasonably necessary for the proper management or maintenance of those common parts. Um, and what's important to note in particular in this case is that one of the things that they tried to do was put sufficient reservations in the development leases. So the owners of those development leases said, well, you don't need to acquire the leasehold interest because we've got all sorts of reservations in favour of the reversion, you'll be fine. And the Court of Appeals said something quite interesting on that. And they said, well, that doesn't work where it's a development lease. So after the development envisaged by the lease, these areas wouldn't be common parts at all. So Quite an important case to bear in mind if what you're trying to do, if you think an enfranchisement is coming and you're trying to hive out development areas, look closely at the terms and look at this case. I'm going to hand you back to Simon. Okay, so just quickly looking at uh, the right to manage. Um, this isn't something you're always going to come up against in, uh, in any uh, residential context, but it does happen. The government's trying to encourage it to happen more and more. We may see some law reform in this area soon to, to 
facilitate that. And it's worth having in the back of your mind that uh, uh, both a site setup stage, uh, if you want to try and avoid it, for example, then mixed use developments. Uh, and also thinking about, well, if it does get exercised, what can we do uh, to make the process go a little smoother than it might otherwise do? Because some leases really don't lend themselves to an RTM situation. So we're just going to touch very quickly on sort of what it is, how you qualify and, and how you bring it about. Um, so what is it? Well, um, it grants long lessees the right to manage their block. They do it through a tenant owned uh, company An RTM company has its own specific provisions. Uh, and you'll find all of the relevant sort of statutory bits in the 2002 Act in part two, chapter one. But you'll also find bits hidden in uh, towards the back in uh, schedule six and seven. Uh, and some pretty important bits in there. It, it's terribly drafted and that's one of the things that means it's a, a wonderful thing for lawyers but not a great thing for landlords or leaseholders. You cannot contract out of the right to manage scheme. It, it's a bit like a halfway house to enfranchise them is the best way to, to see it really. What isn't it? Well it's not the same as the right to appoint a, a manager. Um, so the right to appoint a manager uh, under the 87 Act, which applies to residential properties, is a fault-based scheme and the manager's power comes from the court's uh, order. Uh, it's also not the same as a court-appointed receiver manager uh, under the old system where you just go off to the High Court and then get a manager appointed there. Here, the right to manage companies' rights are solely those in the lease. So if the lease doesn't enable the right to manage company to recover, for example, its costs of operation through a service charge, the right to manage company is going to have to try to find some income in circumstances where it wouldn't ordinarily have some. So there's real difficulties in how the scheme works. Uh, the RTM company can be replaced by a manager and vice versa. Um, but the, the chief point to understand is it's a no fault regime. If the RTM company jumps through all the relevant hoops, there's nothing you can do to oppose or avoid the right to manage ultimately. You can, as a landlord, make a bit of a nuisance of yourself, but ultimately they can get it. Um, so how do you qualify? Well, the building must be a self-contained building or part of a building with or without a person and property, and it has to be at least two flats. Um, what does self-contained mean? Well, there's uh, a huge amount of case law about this, but in essence, uh, it must be structurally detached from any other building i.e. not touching. Uh, the most useful case you can look at on that at the moment is a case called CQN RTM Company in Broad Key North, which is a 2018 upper tribunal decision. Uh, and of course, common issues arise in these sorts of cases. Uh, one example is where, uh, which happens a lot in mixed use properties, you've got sort of a, a retail section that say ground floor offices above that and then residential further up. Uh, and in uh, larger developments, they'll often be sitting on, for example, a much wider concrete slab that's covering an underground car park or something similar to that. Potentially, there's maybe two or three blocks built above that slab. So in that instance, the one residential block for which the right to manage is to be acquired may not be uh, detached. It may not be uh, a structurally self-contained building or part of a building. Uh, so you can have lots of interesting arguments around that. Now, the thing to note is the exemption, uh, and this is similar to, to what Katie was running through in the enfranchisement context, is a 25% non-residential exemption. So if you have more than 25% non-residential, the right to manage uh, doesn't apply as the law currently stands. Uh, note it's question whether it's occupied or intended to be occupied, which can lead to a few interesting arguments. Uh, a lot of the case law, including the stuff that Katie was touching on in an enfranchisement context, can also be applied to the right to manage context in terms of working out what's residential and what's non-residential. There are a few places where the uh, authorities depart, but broadly, broadly they follow the same uh, school of thought. You have things like parking spaces and storage areas that come with flats are included within uh, the residential element. Um, 
you can then also have issues, for example, where you have a commercial lease that is treated as uh, in part residential. So don't be confused or fall into the trap of thinking just because it's a 54 Act lease that it doesn't include parts that are residential, for example. Uh, there's a case called uh, Gainold and uh, WHRA RTM, which is a 2006 case where staff accommodation and a staff kitchen were attached to a restaurant and the staff accommodation was considered to be part of the residential floor area. And you can also have, for example, service departments, things like, you know, similar to hotel rooms where services are provided uh, that are seen as residential, even though they are, we might think, commercial in nature. Live work units, again, have often been found to be residential rather than part resi and part commercial. So uh, lots of grey areas to consider. Uh, what do you acquire when you acquire the right to manage? Well, the right to manage company acquires the management functions. That's all the services, repairs, maintenance, so on and so forth. Um, what that leads to in a mixed use context is, of course, the potential for uh, two different managers uh, with respect to the same property. So you'll have the right to manage company that's managing, for example, the structural parts that are shared by all the properties that the landlord will continue managing, for example, internal repairs in the commercial units if it's uh, if, it, if it's a lease that's set up with landlord obligations in that regard. So you might have one repairing obligation on the part of a landlord where the RTM company has the obligations under that covenant with respect to uh, the structure and the landlord has the responsibilities with respect to the internal parts of the commercial units. Sometimes people will cooperate, other times people won't cooperate and, and you have chaos. Um, so that can be good fun. Um, rights not acquired, rights received ground rents, um, functions relating to forfeiture and possession. Um, just on the last slide, we have uh, some issues that commonly come up. I'm not going to run through them today. Um, very happy to have a chat with anyone in due course, but in essence, the right to manage scheme is a nightmare. It doesn't work very well. It's fraught with problems, but we don't have time for all my war stories. So we're going to move on to rights of first refusal. Right, so tenants rights first refusal, next up. Um, so this is a really important area, um, particularly in relation to mixed use premises. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that it, it's quite often overlooked um, and possibly misunderstood in practice. So it's all within part one of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1987. Um, it does come with a pretty hefty health warning. Um, it is a very polite way to explain the statutory provisions to say they're difficult. Um, they are in places, frankly, a nightmare. Uh, there is also pretty limited case law, uh, which again, makes it more difficult. Um, I'm just going to touch on two issues uh, which may apply with particular relevance to mixed-use premises. Uh, so first of all, does it apply at all to your mixed-use premises? And secondly, do these rights of first refusal apply to a disposal of a solely commercial element within a development? So over the next two slides, what I've done is just set out a very brief overview of how tenants' rights of first refusal work. And um, as Simon said, uh, these slides are going to be available, I think, after this talk. So I'm not going to take you through all of it, but in very, very short outline, essentially, if a landlord of a qualifying tenant makes a relevant disposal of qualifying premises, essentially, um, a certain number of qualifying tenants have the right of first refusal. So they have first go at that disposal on the terms at which the landlord has offered it. And importantly, if the landlord fails to do so, the tenants have the option to acquire from the purchaser as well. Um, just one thing to flag here is that the landlord is the immediate landlord of a qualifying tenant, uh, unless he is the tenant under a lease of less than seven years, in which case it's the immediate landlord and his immediate landlord. Um, so what that means is that the immediate landlord, i.e. the relevant landlord for the disposal, can actually be quite low down the chain. Um, so something just to be careful with. So you see here, we're just going through a brief overview. I'll leave you to digest that in your own time. Um, so 
first thing, does it apply to the premises? So again, as with uh, collective enfranchisement, and you'll see some of this is quite similar, premises must consist of the whole or part of a building, contain two or more flats held by qualifying tenants, and the total number of flats held by qualifying tenants must exceed 50% of the total number of flats. So be careful because this looks at first glance to be identical to collective enfranchisement. The percentages are different, so be careful. Uh, worth noting that a qualifying tenant is not necessarily a long lessee. They are a tenant of a flat other than pursuant to the 54 Act, uh, a protected short hold, or an employment, so a tenancy that ceases with their employment, or an assured or assured agricultural occupancy. And importantly, if a qualifying tenant's landlord is also a qualifying tenant, the tenant isn't. So you need to go up the chain to find your qualifying tenant. As with collective enfranchisement, there's a non-residential proviso, it's in section 1-3, so part or parts of the premises, occupied or intended to occupied otherwise than for residential purposes, and that exceeds 50% of the total internal floor area. And again, disregarding common parts. So, what does that actually mean? What's quite important to note is that building in section 1-2 includes appurtenances to the building. So, what that means in practical terms is the building is not confined to bricks and mortar. So, for example, in the Dean Tower case, uh, it included gardens, but not garages, which were let under completely separate leases. Um, there's been some discussion quite recently in a case uh, of York House and Thompson, and it's worth saying that there is so little case law on tenants' rights of first refusal, that York House and Thompson is, is a really good starting point if you need to get into the area. But essentially there are two types of pertinences. It's either areas over which the tenants have rights under their leases, or it's areas usually enjoyed with the building, uh, including those to which access is required by the landlord to comply with its obligations to repair and maintain the building. So the appurtenances can be quite a bit broader than you might normally think of as being comprised within the building. Um, worth bearing in mind, and it's flagged in the LM Holmes decision that I touched upon, and we were talking about collective enfranchisement. Appurtenances is not part of the statutory definition. It's a judicial gloss. What you're looking at really is, is what does premises mean? That, that's the real question. What, what, what's the meaning of building? What's within it? Uh, common parts has the same meaning as the 1993 Act, uh, and as Simon said, there's an awful lot of grey areas around exactly how a part can be qualified. And whilst it might seem quite academic, if you're on the margins with the percentages, it, it can make the difference as to whether a premises is qualifying or not. A um, couple of points just to note from York House, uh, the fact that there are pipes running through an area, is not by itself sufficient to make that area common parts. And importantly, if an area is common parts because of its use, that use must not have ceased. So for example, a communal toilet that has been closed up and not used, assuming there's no obligations within the leases, is unlikely to still be a common part. Next issue with tenants rights of first refusal, um, and this is still up for grabs, there is not a definitive decision on this. Um, the question is this, if you dispose of a solely commercial part of a mixed use building that otherwise qualifies uh, for tenants rights of first refusal, does it trigger tenants rights of first refusal? So imagine, uh, for example, a block of flats with shops underneath. If you dispose of one of those shops, for example, via a 1954 Act renewal, does that trigger tenants' rights of first refusal? A couple of things that have been determined. Um, a relevant disposal is a disposal of any part of the qualifying building. It's not limited to a disposal of a part which is common parts or subject to rights held by two or more qualifying tenants. Um, there's two cases there where that's been determined. So the relevant premises are identified objectively without reference to the subject matter of the disposal. So what that means is you don't say, well, I'm disposing of a shop, that shop doesn't qualify, that's not qualifying premises. 
you have to look at the building within which the shop is located to then work out whether or not that building qualifies. Um, just worth flagging, paragraph 99 of the York House decision, uh, this point does not directly arise for decision in this case. So as yet, no binding determination. So there are a couple of arguments either way. Um, you might say, well, a disposal pursuant to the 1993 Act, um, for example, a lease extension, is not a relevant disposal. So it would be rather odd if a purely commercial lease renewal under the 54 Act was. Uh, a tenant of a business tenancy is not a qualifying tenant because he's not the tenant of a flat, so he has no say in any of this. Uh, and a tenancy of a single flat is not a relevant disposal. So it seems rather strange that something that's primarily designed to benefit residential tenants doesn't apply to the disposal of a single flat, but would apply to the lease of a single unit specifically for business purposes. However, there are some arguments the other way. Um, the Act applies to buildings which are essentially residential in character, and therefore it's right that the tenants should have some control over the commercial element. Um, and importantly, it is contemplated that the Act could apply to buildings with a commercial element. Um, hence the, the proviso as to the amount of non-residential floor space. So up for grabs, there's some interesting arguments, but it's certainly something that's worth bearing in mind. And now I'm going to hand you back to Simon for service charges. Okay, this is the last, the last little bit. We're on the home straight, and I'm not going to cover an awful lot of service charges, partly because I, I'm sure uh, many of you have some uh, working knowledge of this area. Uh, and also just because I want to stick uh, broadly to time. Um, it, I see some issues come up all the time. I just wanted to touch on those very quickly. Uh, on the next slide, um, we have um, the quote from section 38 of the 85 Act. So this is the definition of a dwelling. It's a building or part of a building occupied or intended to be occupied as a separate dwelling together with any yard, garden, outhouses, so on and so forth. Um, so if any part of the premises amounts to a dwelling, the whole of the statutory overlay relating to residential service charges is going to apply. So um, two things arise from that. One is that you've got to think very carefully about what exactly is meant by a building that's occupied or intended to be occupied as a separate dwelling. And the second thing is to bear in mind that point that it applies to, uh, even if only a very small amount of the uh, land let is residential in nature. Uh, and that's what comes up in those two cases at the bottom of the slide. So Oakfern and Ruddy concern the position of a mean landlord. Um, in essence, if you've got a, if you're a freeholder and you've sublet uh, under a head lease, the entirety of the residential parts, thinking you've of all responsibility of complying with the residential overlay and you just leave yourself with a nice, tidy, easy to manage commercial bits. Bear in mind that if you retain any management functions with respect to the residential parts, you're going to have to comply, at least to the extent relevant to the residential parts, with all the residential overlay. So. For example, if you're managing the wider estate, you're passing on some estate charges, you need to make sure that when you demand them from the mean landlord, you're complying with all the resi overlay. And if you do any major works, you're going to have to consult with all of the tenants, all the residential tenants that are not your direct tenant. Um, the other thing to think about, and this is the JLK case, which is a really good example of what's meant by intended to be occupied as a separate dwelling. Uh, and in that case, it was student accommodation in issue. Uh, and the, uh, in that case, the student accommodation consists of a bedroom with um, uh, its own bathroom, but each of the student flats shared living space and shared kitchen. So they had their own bathrooms, but shared kitchens, shared living space. Uh, and in that case, the upper tribunal found that those properties were dwellings but they were not separate dwellings because they didn't have the separate living space and kitchen. So therefore weren't caught by the 
residential overlay and it's always going to be really fact and context sensitive so you can have some really interesting um sort of gray areas on that uh, if we just skip over the next couple of slides which concern the sort of overlay for uh whether costs are reasonably incurred um leave it on those slides the last thing is um just a few other service charge issues to be aware of um if, Kate, if you can just go over one more slide for me. Uh, the first thing is to make sure if you're principally dealing with the commercial side, particularly if your client's agent is principally dealing with the commercial side of things, that they remember the need to consult on major works. Essentially any works where the leaseholders, residential leaseholders, are going to have to contribute £250 or more. Um, there's a time limit for making demands at section 20b so if you if more than 18 months have elapsed since uh the landlord incurred costs they can't be recovered unless they've been protected so uh accounts and demands have to be sent out reasonably promptly uh and then at the bottom there section 27a sub 6 is to bear in mind that with residential leases uh, some terms can be uh, rendered void and this can be a real issue with apportionment of service charges in developments and especially in mixed-use developments because if you have a lease that for instance says um, the uh, proportion of service charges payable by uh, leaseholders is a fair and reasonable proportion to be determined by the landlord surveyor whose decision shall be final which is a, a very uh, familiar one uh, and was the situation, I think, in, in the uh, Windermere and Wild case. Uh, any kind of provision that provides for the uh, apportionment to be determined in a particular way is void, and it's left to the FTT to determine what that fair reasonable proportion is. No great problem, you might think, until you realise you've been doing it in one way for 12 years, and the FTT determines otherwise, and you have a big shortfall. Uh, and uh, I had this situation in the Williams and Aviva investors case, which uh, the decision came out a couple of months ago. And in that case, it was a fixed proportion in the lease or such alternative proportion as the landlord reasonably determines. And in that case, uh, the ability to vary the apportionment in its entirety was removed. So the upper tribunal found that you were stuck with the fixed proportions, which in uh, that case had been applied for 11 years or so uh, and is potentially going to lead to a short now that's currently subject to an appeal to the Court of Appeal so watch this space see if we get permission for a second appeal but it can be a real issue uh, and the the mixed use point is that of course the first tier tribunal might decide that in fact all the commercial tenants should be paying a much greater percentage of the overall costs one often finds that residential lessees are effectively uh, paying a greater proportion of the service charges than ideally they would be. I, I assume because it's easier to attract the commercial tenants by having lower service charges. Now, if the FTT determines that, you might be left unable to get uh, a greater proportion out of all your commercial tenants and might end up stuck. And also you might find that this is applied retrospectively. So it's an issue to be aware of. I think those were the only points I wanted to mention on service charges and that brings us to the end uh, so thank you very much for coming uh, as we say the slides will be on the website and the recording will be on the website over the next day or so and uh, i hope you find it useful thanks very much thank you